can you relate to the fish out of water kind of experience? Maybe it's when you go someplace and you greet a person and you're not quite sure, or am I close enough to this person that this is a handshake or a hug? So you kind of have to do the, you know, the, the multi utility kind of greeting. Maybe it's the kind of thing where you don't know how you're supposed to dress for the social situation. You go and you find out that you're dressed far too formally or far too casually. Maybe it's the first time that you meet the family of that special someone and you walk into a conversational landmine. These sorts of situations can be embarrassing and uncomfortable, but we kind of manage to get through them. But imagine instead that you are uh, an immigrant. You don't know the language and you don't know the culture. How much more susceptible are you to really embarrassing or uncomfortable situations in this new place where you find yourself? You take it up a whole other level and let's say you're not a different immigrant, you are forced to go to a certain place that's different from where you work, and now you have to live in a place you forced you to move there. And that's where the Jews find themselves in today's passage that I'm going to look at in the book of Jeremiah. The Babylonians took off a wave of exiles about 10 years before the actual, the final exile where they destroyed Jerusalem. They took away most of the Jewish leadership and exiled them to Babylon. There were priests among them who prophesied that they were going to return in a couple of years, and the people didn't need to put down any roots. Jeremiah captures wind of this in Jerusalem, and so he writes a letter and sends it off to the exiles in Babylon. The letter opens like this in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 47. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives who exile to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For its welfare will determine your welfare. Now, despite the promises of the false prophet, Jeremiah has some unwelcome news for these people. This isn't going to be a quick stay. They're going to need to be here for some time. And so planting houses or planting gardens and building houses and having families are just a practical step that the community needs to take in preparation for a multi-generational sojourn. Now, despite the unwelcome news, this actually has a bit of a blessing implied by it. The people might assume that God is punishing them, but that God might continue to punish them. While they are in Babylon, he might continue to put the screws in them. But here he commands them to multiply, to increase in number, which is only possible if God allows them some level of blessing. And so what this is showing is essentially how these people are in exile. It's a difficult situation, but God is going to bless them in the midst of the difficulty that he's, you know, allowed them to suffer. But I think the most important part of this section of the letter really has to do with the, the relationship between the Jewish exiles and the community into which they have been exiled. Because the challenge of faithfulness when you live in a monolithic religious community where you're the religious majority are different than the challenges of faithfulness when you live in a community where you are the religious minority. To this point in the history, the Jews have always been a religious majority in the countries where they find themselves. If you start with the birth of the nation at the exile, they live in a camp surrounded by other Jews. When they come into the promised land, there are foreigners and aliens and other Canaanites that are still left in the land, but the Jews form the majority. And so they, they have rules that they follow about their society and their country, and they can't do that when they're in exile. So now they have to figure out what faithfulness looks like when they're just this small religious island amongst the sea of pagans. Should they avoid interaction? Should they try to be uh, antagonistic towards the culture around them? Should they give up what makes them unique? Jeremiah gives them guidance. He tells them that they are supposed to work for the good of the community where they find themselves. Now, on one hand, this is a common sense approach. He grounds it himself into us, saying, well, you know, a high tide boat floats all boats. So 
works pretty good, and we will share in the benefit. But undoubtedly, there are probably those who believe that the Babylonian captives are the enemies of God, and so working for the benefit of that community is, is disrespectful to God, and so they might go the way of Jehovah. Being willing to throw their lives away to harm the enemies that they perceive their God has. But Jeremiah tells them that that's not the approach that God wants of them. They are meant to work for the benefit of the Babylonians, even though those Babylonians are their enemies. And while he does ground this in self interest, this foreshadows. A teaching that's going to come into clearer focus in the life and teaching example of Jesus from 600 years later. Now, most of us can't imagine what it would be like to be an exile in a foreign land. But, despite the wide gulf between their experience and our experience, there is a common thread that we see in both, and that is that we live as a religious minority in a pluralistic culture. We both try to live faithfully when we are surrounded by people who don't share our values and are sometimes even antagonistic towards those values and towards us as a community. So over time, the church has tried various ways of interacting with the world, some of which I think are not very faithful to what Jesus tells us. And I want to propose a way that sort of follows Jeremiah's advice that is faithful to the example. Now, I don't normally do alliteration, but today in both. The different ways that we can interact with the world uh, start with choices, rather than straight teeth. The cloistered way means that we build a religious bubble around ourselves where we try to limit the interaction that we have with people who aren't like us. As Anabaptists, this is the way that our forebears often acted. They were badly persecuted in Europe by both the Roman Catholics and the Reformers, and so when they came to the New World, they tended to create insular communities where they had very limited contact with people outside. And that had the effect of reducing the persecution. The culture might have thought they were weird, but they didn't interact with them enough to really want to bother them very much. But to use Jesus' parlance, we became like those who light a lamp and put it under a bowl. So the calling of the church is to be a representative of God in the place where they find themselves. Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. As Jesus perfectly represents God, so we, collectively, in our life together, are meant to perfectly represent God. But how do we perfectly represent God if we hide who we are to those outside who need to see God? And so a cloistered approach is not faithful to our mission. The next approach that people try is the combative approach. The combative approach takes an antagonistic view towards the culture outside. And it often tries to use the levers of power to coercively force other people to become like us. So this is the culture warrior approach, if you will. But there's a problem with this. When we look at Jesus, we don't see someone who tries to combatively coerce the world into behaving in a proper manner. If Jesus' desire was to dominate, he surely wouldn't have needed to go to the cross. But as Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for men. And so when we try to represent the God who refuses to try to dominate and instead uses service and persuasion, when we try to represent him to the world by coercion, by combativeness, we distort the gospel itself. And we expose ourselves to charges of hypocrisy and cruelty. So we shouldn't be choiced, but neither should we be combative. Another approach could simply be to be compromising, to give up that which makes us a distinct community. That might mean walking away from faith entirely, or it might mean compartmentalizing faith, putting it in its own little private box when it doesn't come out and touch any of the other areas of our life. And so if your faith sits nicely in a little box, 
but it doesn't have anything to say about your values and your aspirations in life, then you have compromised the faith. You've given up what makes you unique. You are, like Jesus says, the salt that has lost its saltiness and is only useful to be trampled into the foot of the new attire. Sorry. So when you look at areas in your life, like ethics, how you have to be paid towards people, about how you respond to those who are hurting and in need, about what the good life entails, about how you spend your money, about all sorts of things like this. If your faith has nothing to say to it, then your faith is compartmentalized. And you've lost the distinct that makes you distinctly Christian. And so I don't think it's appropriate for us to live closely, to live combatively, or to live in a compromising way. Instead, the final key, the way that I think we're supposed to live is a communal way. A favorable predisposition towards those outside <coughs> that allows us to retain our distinctiveness. This is following what Jeremiah tells the exiles to do, to work for the good of our community by being distinct. Now, when you say working for the good, obviously you have to define what good is because it's a subjective term. One person's good is another person's evil. And so our view of what is good, the thing that we are supposed to work for for our community, must be inspired by our vision of the kingdom of God. The place of maximum human flourishing where people are properly related to God and properly related to one another. Not just where our actions are appropriate, but where our hearts and motivations are also appropriate. And so as the church, we model a life together that shows an alternative way of being that points towards the kingdom of God. That's our mission, even though we often do this poorly. But it's what we are called to strive towards. And so we take Christian values and we try to implement them in ourselves as a community with poor standards that allows other people to be invited in. And then we speak prophetically to the world, not waving our finger and saying you should be doing it like us, but speaking out against the injustices that we see and proposing alternative solutions. A couple of examples. We in the church believe in the dignity of human beings that are made in the image of God and purchased with the blood of Jesus. And so the rich and the poor, the talented and the untalented, the righteous and the unrighteous, are all equally loved by God and equally converted in dignity and respect. And so what we ought to strive for in our interactions with one another is to treat everybody, whether the world says they're dignified or not, as if they're dignified. And then when we interact with the world, we speak out against that which diminishes the value of others. And so if we see, for example, laws enacted that favor rich people against poor people, we say that's not appropriate because poor people have dignity too. As Christians, we ought to believe in restoration over retribution. And so in our dealings with one another, when we try to mediate conflict, we ought to, to have an eye to restoring the relationship between the two people that are at, at odds, rather than trying to make sure that the one who wronged the other one pays for their actions. And when we speak in our culture, we speak with a belief that God can bring healing to the life of the sinner. And so there is a, a, an important uh, restorative aspect to justice, not simply something that is distributed, but just that gets back at people for doing wrong. As Christians, we ought to believe in generosity over consumption. While the world might say that the good life is comprised of a life with lots of good stuff, we as the Christians have a different perspective, or we ought to, because a good life is a life in which we are properly related. And that means that we have a, a, an ability to share with one another. There may be seasons when I find myself having more than I need, and I have the ability to share that with other people. There might be a season when I have less than I need, and I can receive that humbly from other people. So, good life is not about making sure that I have the newest car, the shiniest tux, the biggest house. 
it's about being, about being grounded in a community where I belong and where I can generously share with one another. And then as we speak to the world, we need to say, it's not about how much you have. It's about being properly related to people. And so we should, should reject the narrative that our job as people, as citizens, is to consume, 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 and that that's all we should direct our lives towards. So our life together can offer an alternative vision of what human, what human community can be. And so that becomes an invitation to the world. Our actions as Christians glorify or discredit God in the eyes of the world. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So a congenial approach works for the good of others, even if those people are hostile towards us. And so, working for the good of our community, where we've been exiled, so to speak, is essentially the practical outworking of Jesus' most central and challenging teaching, the teaching of enemy love. In Luke chapter 6, 27 to 36, Jesus says this, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who curse you. If someone slaps you in one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your skirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get any credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who will repay you, why should you get any credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. If he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. So the discipline of enemy love is the greatest opportunity that we have to show the world the God that we worship. After all, if you are kind to a person who is kind back to you, no one's going to take any notice of that. You're just a properly emotionally adjusted adult. That's great, but it's not remarkable. But if instead you work for the good of the very people who work against your good, people will take notice of that. And in that, they will see the character of the God we worship revealed in Jesus on the cross. The God who is gracious to us, offers hospitality without fault, and works to benefit the righteous and the wicked alike. Our exile in the secular world is the greatest opportunity we have to show those who do not know our God what he is like. But in order to do that, we have to be faithful representatives of Jesus in our life together, in our individual life, and in our dealings with the community. So, in whatever opportunity we have, we can work to benefit the community in which we find ourselves, whether they are hostile or friendly to us. This isn't some ploy to get the world to like us so that we don't have to encounter controversy. This is the outworking of the gospel itself, a group of exiles surrounded by spiritual exiles. 